Hello everyone and welcome to episode 340 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Seth Fred Olive, and we have the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How's it going this fine Monday, Richard? Doing well, Seth. A, a lot of new a lot of new jumpstart cards to go through. Ah, uh, yes, we have so many new cards to talk about from Jumpstart Historic Horizons, but before we get into that, we got another co-host in Krim. How, how are you today, Krim? <laughs> good morning. Uh, good, good morning. I am uh, freshly out of bed, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I need a coffee. I didn't get a coffee yet, but uh, yeah, good, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, today, yeah, we're going to be we're going to be jumping around a bit. Our first topic and probably the biggest one is Jumpstart Historic Horizons. We got new digitally exclusive cards, some crazy stuff going on. So we want to talk about some of that. So uh, that's number one. We got some kind of funny Magic Arena rank news that came up uh, from a Reddit post. We want to talk about a couple of questions from Mark Rosewater that we wanted to answer about kind of future stuff in Magic. And then, of course, answering your fish mail question. So that is the plan for today's cast. Before we jump into that, a reminder that our show today is brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit, you probably heard about them from us before. They're a great way to sell your magic collection, and they're offering a new service geared towards selling smaller batches of valuable cards with a reduced service fee. With their curated shipment service, you can sell your cards for the best available buy list price with only a 5% fee. And as with all Card Conduit services, you don't gotta sort your cards, you don't gotta grade them, you can just safely pack them up and ship them out and and you'll get a detailed report with the results. So you can check out Card Conduit's curated shipment option as a way to buy lists up to 150 cards with fast processing, optimized prices, and the low, low service fee of just 5%. And right now, you can even get a 10% discount by heading over to cardconduit.com slash goldfish. Card Conduit, they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards. So thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And uh, let's talk Jumpstart Historic Horizons. Huh. We're nearing the end of spoiler season. 800 uh, ish cards altogether, including the reprints. I think tomorrow is the last day. So there's like so many cards to talk about. You can see, you know, a whole bunch of them over mtgpreviews.com. We're going to talk about some of the mythics, though. So, Richard, why don't you guide us through some spoilers of these crazy new arena-only cards? All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the Planeswalkers. So last week we talked about Davriel. There is one for each color at Mythic. So uh, let's get to the green one. This is a translation, so the name is not final. Fraley's Sky Shroud Partisan. One green green, so three mana value, uh, four starting loyalty, plus one. Choose up to one target elf, untap it. It and a random elf creature card in your hand each perpetually get plus one, plus one. Minus one, seek an elf card. Minus six, conjure a regal force card onto the battlefield. So it's got the trifecta of new mechanics, uh, perpetually <laughs> seek and conjure all on the same card. Uh, arena mechanic Tron on Fraley's. Yep. Uh, this card, this card is actually really good. I think. I think this is probably the strongest of the new Planeswalkers, in part because it's only three mana, and all the rest of them are four mana. It's narrow. It's obviously an elf card. You're going to have to play in like elf tribal. But in elf tribal, all of those abilities seem really good to me. It can come down on turn one thanks to a Llanowar Elves or whatever, Elvish Mystic. The plus one can untap like your Elvis Arch Druid to make tons of mana. Plus, it's kind of giving plus two, plus two, which is a nice little bonus because you're pumping a creature on the battlefield and in your hand, seeking an elf, essentially drawing a card, but better usually because you know it's going to be a creature rather than uh, some chance of hitting a land. And then the ultimate, putting your Regal Force into play, that used to be a legit thing people did in like Legacy Elves. There was a time like 10 years ago and you play Elves and that was your like refuel card. You cheat a Regal Force into play and draw a bunch of cards and keep the fun going. It's like legitimately powerful. If there's one thing Elves are good at, it's flooding the board with small green creatures and Regal Force draws you a card for each green creature you control. So it's gonna be like a draw seven or something. So I think this card is actually 
actually like kind of insane for elves and might even fix some of their problems with like getting wrecked by sweepers like that's the biggest thing that keeps historic elves from being good but the negative one and the ultimate both seem like pretty decent sweeper protection on a permanent that doesn't get hit by a wrath so this card just seems like kind of insane to me uh, i am very upset that the green one is the good one <laughs> it's like okay sure why not let's have the green one be the cheapest one and the best one uh, but I, I will say, though, that the, the good news here is that, I mean, for all you control mage players, this still gets picked off, along with every other elf, by Shadow's Verdict. So, <laughs> uh, like, that that is that is currently the, like, because elves is actually really popular and historic, so this will be really good for that deck. Because, wow, uh, I, 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 th I think this card is actually very good. Very, 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 very good. Um, at least for elves. So... I, I, I'm excited to see how this plays. Also, Regal Force? Wait a minute. Regal Force? Wow. Okay. Regal Force. You draw a card for each creature, right? It's 5-5? Five, five. Yeah. For each green creature? Uh, each green it, creature, yeah. It's a normally a 7 yeah. drop, but I think this card is quite busted. It depends on how strong the format is, but that plus one is giving me, like, Oko vibes or something. It's like, you get to untap, it's ramp, you get plus two, plus two, and you protect against like over committing onto the board like you're pumping something in your hand right which you can keep for post wrath and you drop a five five elf or something so that's like pretty good for a plus one right like I, I don't know and the fact that you can ramp into this do it on turn two you can just slam down a regal force you can get a random elf like this this seems really good i think that perpetually plus one plus one in hand is actually very strong uh, so I actually think this is a really strong card and you can ultimate this thing pretty quick as well. So I, I don't know, this seems a bit too strong, but we'll see how strong and fast the format actually turns out to be. I, I like that it's narrow. If there's one thing that should make you feel better, Graham, like it, sure, the green one's the most powerful, but at least it only goes in elf deck. So it's not like a, a Nissa situation where it's like, oh my God, this is in like every green deck and every green splash deck. This is only going to go in a very specific subset of green decks. So th those are my favorite planeswalkers, ones that are powerful, but you can't just jam in any deck. And I think that Fraley's kind of hits the mark there. But what if elves is the most popular green deck? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Elves is the most popular thing. Uh, <laughs> so I, that means. I, I would assume you'd be salivating over that, Grim. Like, don't you just wreck elves with all the decks you play? I assume you never yeah, lose mean, to elves. <laughs> I usually don't, but the thing here is now they have this. So now it's like I have to have Shadow's, Shadow's Verdict. Uh, so. That's that's true. This this does help against the Rass to some extent, especially the non-Shadow's Verdict Rass. Yeah. This. I mean, I just think this card is also like... I, I, it's perfect on their curve, right? Because they usually do have a one drop like elf that produces mana and it's going to go right into this. So really this on turn two means that I'll be quite some turns away before I even get to like Shadow's Verdict. I mean, do you imagine like turn one, turn one mana dork, turn two archdruid, turn three this <laughs> off of double tapping the archdruid to just like dump your hand like I was going to be scary fast. Yep, but it's OK. Surely they'll have put some good removal and answers into historic right <laughs> would you like to would you like to perpetually give something negative 1 negative 2 for two mana crim <laughs> i think they'd be they perpetually upset <laughs> if they don't do something <laughs> like <laughs> wait for the perpetual wrath it's just like yeah. Yeah. minus all betrayal <laughs> wipe all forever. creatures perpetually get minus 4 minus 4 it's, it's fine <laughs> Um, yeah, then and <laughs> only then will it be fine. Other than that, I am just going to be perpetually sad. Let's check up on the white planeswalker. Maybe maybe white can help you here, Krim. We got Teo, Aegis Adept, two white white, so four mana <laughs> value, ah. four starting loyalty, uh, plus one, up to one target creature's base power perpetually becomes equal to its toughness. It perpetually gains. This creature can attack as though it didn't have defender. Minus two, conjure a lumbering light shield card onto the battlefield. Minus six, you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, return target white creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. You gain life equal to its toughness. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Teo. <laughs> I, uh, it, it, it's, it's not bad. It's not. So, so Teo, I think it's sweet for like Arcades or something. Like, not, not obviously a good deck, but if you want to play like a Toughness Matters, you know, Assault Formation style deck, this seems like a sweet Planeswalker for something like that. You know, the plus one's like a Rolling Stone that also lets you deal damage equal to your toughness rather than your power. Lumbering Light Shield is like a 1-4, and then you can like tutor it up and then turn it into a 4-4 four, four essentially with a plus one. It, it's not a not a strong card, but I think it'd be fun to play in like a, a Toughness Matters like butt style deck, which some have existed in Historic. They're not tier by any stretch, but you can build a functional like Assault Formation deck. I feel this is like the yeah. uncommon Planeswalker. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like this, technically this... it does things, but you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get like a mediocre creature going uh, as opposed <laughs> to say Frailies. Uh, but yeah, I mean, every every card has a role in some deck in Magic. So yeah, I guess you could find a home for Teo. <laughs> This, this sounds like Richard trying to politely say, yes, of course, there's always a home for this card somewhere. Look, remember, remember the time I pulled off like an eight card combo to animate a Black Lotus just to attack? Like, I feel yeah. like Teo's like just one notch above that. <laughs> I, oh, like, okay. <laughs> the, the weird thing is like, even if this was three mana, I still think it'd be way worse than Fraley's, right? Like, it, why is Fraley's yes. three mana two when, mana like, Teo is four mana bad. and all the other ones are four mana? Yeah, it's like, uh, why did they give the discount to Fraley's? That's very strange to me. It's green. It uh. has built-in ramp. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the color that ramps needs the cheaper cards. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. Ramp. <laughs> sense. <laughs> I will not be upset that the green one's good. I all right. will not be upset that the green one is good. Let's, right, let's, sorry, let's go with Green's friend, myself. Blue, the other part of Simic. Maybe Krim will be happy with Kiora, the Tide's Fury. Uh, three and a blue, so four mana value, four starting loyalty, plus one, conjure a Kraken Hatchling card into your hand, plus one, untap target creature or land, prevent all damage that would belt two and buy that permanent until your next turn. Minus three, you may sacrifice a Kraken. If you do, create an 8-8 blue Kraken creature token. What is a Kraken hatchling? <laughs> it's a, it's a, a one zero mana four. zero four, yes. <laughs> it goes a tail? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a combo. You make get the, you conjure the Krakens and then make them four fours it's with tail. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah, need that. other cards. It's a self-sustaining combo. Re <laughs> we Remember are when off. like... Jason Gideon dominated standard and they had to ban Jace. This is basically yeah. basically the same. I don't know. Jason you... Gideon 2021. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, okay. I, I, uh, I like that the second plus one can be used defensively. That's one issue I've had with most of these planeswalkers is they're really bad at defending themselves. But being able to plus one on one of your opponent's big threats and make it so it can't deal damage for a turn. That is kind of good defense, and I guess just spewing out a Kraken Hatchling every turn, that's a that's a lot of blocking, but uh, I don't know. Like, what does this card do? You, like, make a Hatchling and then turn it into an 8-8, eight -eight, and then it gets Fatal Push, and then you cry? Like, I I don't know. It doesn't seem great to me. I, I won't lie to you. I'm like, if I saw this, most of the time I'm going to just ignore it. <laughs> you need to cast the <laughs> like, Hatchling, too, right? You have to pay the banner for it. It's not yeah, even onto the battlefield, but you could get the hatchling, use Teo to make it a 4 4. <laughs> well, I mean, once again, I it is popping off over there, okay? Like, like that's the dream. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie to you. There, there's a little bit of a difference between a few planeswalkers that have been mentioned here today. <laughs> Let's just say Teo and Kiora. Versus one green one. I don't okay? know why they got to be I four say, mana. Like, like, like. Yeah, it could be a lot lower and still be of questionable quality. But I don't know why four. It, even if they were cheaper, that doesn't change the abilities. Yeah. So I okay maybe it, like and I, I think that second plus one could have totally been a lot like the Kiora the Crashing Wave in that it could target any permanent, and it would prevent damage from that permanent. So this then would allow me. To like, you know, I, I mean, Burning Earth, if they decide to ever add something like that, I can blank that too. I mean, it may seem like corner pocket cases, but being able to t like blank it, like maybe some kind of enchantment that's pinging you every turn. Let's say Roiling Vortex. So, uh, I don't know. I think that second plus one could have done that. The first plus one, I, I 
come on. Put it on the at least at least put it on the battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> at least put it on the battlefield. Come on. Oh, or right. make two Kraken hatchlings. That would that it's, would make it better. <laughs> I might have to go to discard, but yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Red is the last hope. Sarkin Wanderer to Shiv. Four man of value. Four starting loyalty. Plus one. Dragon cards in your hand perpetually gain. This spell costs one less to cast, and you may pay X rather than the spell's mana cost, where X is its mana value. Zero, conjure a Shivan Dragon card into your hand. Minus two, Sarkin deals three damage to target creature. The, okay. What? Oh, come on, man. All right, so we, the <laughs> dragons already have enough five, four plus cards. But if this Sarkon were, you know, maybe three mana like a certain other one uh this would be very good i think that plus one is super solid like it would help if it, this were a three mana planeswalker i think the zero conjuring a shivan dragon is kind of troll because that's you know not necessarily a, a like a house now if this if this were four mana and conjured a shivan dragon onto the board that might be a little bit powerful but you know i i i think that this this one also just felt extremely underwhelming. It shouldn't be four mana, and yeah, you know, should shouldn't be four mana, or may, or I, either that or Freilis should have been four mana. Yeah, that that might be that Freilis should have been four mana. I I actually like Sarkin though. Like the zero ability, they obviously could have let us conjure something more powerful than Shiv and Dragon, but I appreciate that as they're doing this never seen before digital only Hearthstone mechanic thing. They're still keeping a connection to the game's past. Like, Shiv and Dragon is an iconic card from the very first Magic set. So, obviously, it would be way stronger if you were turning up, like, uh, Inferno with the Star Mounts. Like, the new, you know, upgraded 2021 version of Shiv and Dragon. But I like the I like the connection to the game's history. I also think the plus one, like, that's the reason to play the card. I think the plus one is, like, insane. Not only does it ramp you, but it also fixes your mana. Of course, it only hits cards in your hand, which is a little bit of a drawback. It's not going to do anything if you're, like, empty-handed. Then you're, I guess, conjuring Shivan Dragons or whatever. But I imagine, like, uh, Time Mat or whatever. We, we just played on stream last week a five-color Time Mat Dragon deck, and it felt pretty solid. But five colors, a little bit questionable. Sometimes you got mana trouble. I feel like Sarkin just solves that. You just play this, you plus one it. All of a sudden, your Tiamat Mat is going to be six generic mana rather than seven mana including wooberg and then if you do it again you're going to be able to reduce the cost and make colorless all the dragons you tutor up with time at so i actually think the plus one is the selling point and i could imagine playing this card in like historic five color dragons just because the plus one is seems really really strong to me even at four mana uh, the issue here is that i don't know if i like this more than sarkon fireblood i know that that plus one's very good but because it comes in at four mana that is actually a big problem because oftentimes like at least Sarkon Fireblood will like kind of help you like filter by looting through your, your, your cards, but it also adds to mana. Thus moving, going from three to making it that on turn four, you can drop your five drop. Whereas this is your turn four play and you don't really ramp into a turn four play all that well. It's kind of awkward. So if you're a dragon deck, this is at a weird curve, a weird spot of the curve. But then you just play both and you can discard the new one to Dragon Blood <laughs> in search of your good dragons. Kind of like the Moonfolk trick where you play them and then scry them to the bottom while you look for your yeah. good cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Ah, yes, that card. I don't want to ever use it or see it, but if I but I'll put it in my deck. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean this lets I you mean, cast seven drop dragons on turn five. The, the question is, is this a thing you can be doing in historic, right? Like this stacks, right? If this is on for four turns wait, for some reason. Wait, how? Because all dragons perpetually get this cost one less. If you double plus, you get oh, minus oh, two, yeah. right? Okay, okay. Yeah. If, if I got to live after playing a four mana thing. I mean, you play four mana, you plus. Presumably, you somehow protected it. You untap, you plus again. That doesn't seem unreasonable, but the question is, can you... Are you still alive? And like, is this what you ought to be doing? Because that meant your hand had seven drops in it. Um, but I don't know. It, it could be good, but it seems awfully slow. Like looking at all the cards they added to the format, it looks like they want this to be like a jacked up modern or something. And 
I don't know that you're playing seven drops and well, trying to drop them on turn five. Is it a is thing a jacked up do, modern, right? Like it's you know. dropping cracking hatchlings, dude. Have you seen Tao? This is this is terrifying. <laughs> All right, all right. I want before before we move on. We've talked about all five planeswalkers. Putting you on the spot. Give me give me your countdown. Rank rank the five new planeswalkers from the set. <laughs> Just in your your opinion. We didn't go over this earlier, so I won't hold you to it. But your subjective power ranking of those five. My subjective. Okay, of those five, first is Fraley's, second is Fraley's, third is Fraley's, fourth <laughs> is Fraley's, fifth is Forest. And then that's it. <laughs> Richard. Oh, oh I, f- I forgot. There's three, four other ones. Sorry. I, think I don't know. <laughs> top to bottom, Freilis, Davriel, Kiora, Sarkin, Teo? Or maybe swap Sarkin and Kiora. I'm going to put Davriel up there because I really still don't know what he does and he's got to do something good. <laughs> Whereas I know what Kiora and Sarkin do and they're not very good. So there's some upside <laughs> that there's some undiscovered synergies with Davriel. Um, Wait. Is Ke- what? Okay, Richard. I'll say this again. Kraken Hatchling for your troubling times. How, that That's pretty good, right? That's got to be powerful. <sighs> I mean, okay. <laughs> it, a, a, a real ranking would be Freyly, Sarkon, and then Dav. Actually, you know, Freyly, Davriel, Sarkon. Legitimately, I think both Teo and Kiora are really bad. Like, they're just, like, not playable. Like, I would not <laughs> play these. <laughs> if you cared about like legitimately how well the, how good these cards are and like if you want to put them in a functioning deck now i'm not saying you can't make a crack a, a kraken hatchling and a teo deck okay so <laughs> so it is possible that they could get played but is it good and, th- and i am ranking by how good it is my list actually is a lot like crims i would go fraley's sarkin kiora davriel teo well you think davriel is is worse. I, I think Davriel's really bad. I think Davriel's bad. I mean, the hatchlings. Rather have the how eight eight crack. Okay. <laughs> whatever you, nonsense Davriel is doing. I, I have the opposite <laughs> idea of Richard. I, since I don't know what Davriel does, I'm gonna I'm gonna go conservative. <laughs> I know what Cure does. It's not good, but at least I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy, you know, I guess. <laughs> Uh, all right, we got one other. We got one other. There's a ton of cards from the set. There's too many that we can talk about. So check them out on mtgpreviews.com. But we got one other card I really want to get your opinion on, which is Pool of Vigorous Growth. One and a green artifact. Pay X, tap it, discard a card, create a token that's a copy of a random creature with mana value X. Activate it only as a sorcery. It is quite literally Momir Vig Avatar legal in historic in artifact form what do you think of this card like do you first off is this card playable is it something that could show up in decks secondly what do you think of this level of variance because momir like it is known to be a high variance format this the whole gimmick is you could be getting a scornful egotist you could be getting a crater hoof behemoth and winning the game like you never know do you think cards with this level of variance are uh, is that scary at all? Could that be a bad thing for the format, or do you think it's underpowered enough that it's going to be fine? Thoughts on Pool of Vigorous Growth? Well, I think it's actually pretty good. And regardless of whether or not you have something you get, whatever three drop you decide to curve into this one with, right? Well, it is it is something every turn. It's super solid. Like, if I'm getting flooded out, I will gladly take this. So I, I think this card's pretty solid, a, a solid sideboard card. Um, I mean, the randomness of it doesn't, I don't think it hurts me that much. Uh, are there any three drops or four drops? I mean, that lose me the game on the spot. I don't think so. Unless like I'm playing elves and I hit a Kervik on four, right? So like, uh, so, uh, I, I, I don't think this is that like the randomness matters all that much. This card's terrible. I, um, it'll be a house and limited. Yeah. It will be very good to sideboard in against your creatureless control decks, right? But anything else is going to be bad. Like, you're going to pay, like, five mana, get, like, a 1-1, and that's just not going to cut it. Uh, And people can remove this. Unlike actual Momir Vig, where you can't remove the emblem, this thing can go away as well, right? And I think it's not, like, maybe the card pool is high enough, but I doubt it since we have, like, limited... Uh, formats for like all the the cards in the format like you you will get duds you will get cards you won't even play in limited 
And the only thing that makes Momir good is your opponent is doing the exact same thing. But imagine if your opponent is on the other side playing Frailies, and here you are like getting random creatures out of the battlefield. Like it's not what you want to be doing. So I guess sideboard in against Krim, where a five mana one one might cut, you know, might get the cut and actually kill Krim. But other than that, I can't imagine you playing this seriously. It's oh. cheap though. It's two mana, Richard. It's two mana. It costs you a, a card, this... and it costs you another like a random. Like, that means your deck has like. No cards in it, right? Like, if you have legitimate creatures, you would just play them. You're hoping to win right. the lottery to get an under-costed creature, but what would that be, and what are the odds of it actually well, happening? Would you... I mean, I would love this in the position of where, okay, I drew removal against my control deck, or, or against your opponent's control deck, or you drew more lands, right? So... I kind of like this in those exact situations where I can just now discard them and turn them into something else. Yeah, I, I actually think this card has potential to be decent. Like, I, I do think it's more of a sideboard card, but I really yeah. like that in the late game, once you get up to, you know, seven or eight mana, you, you and you don't want lands, and you don't want that removal spell, or you don't want your, you know, Elvish Mystic or whatever, like, this is going to give you an eight drop every turn, which seems really powerful. Sure, you can't control it, but... Any eight drop is going to be better than the random land that you top decked or whatever. And it seems very good against control decks. Like against control, it can't really be countered easily. Uh, I guess you could stifle it or something. But it reminds me a little bit of like Vivian's Arcbow, which is a card that doesn't see a ton of play. But I've always liked it in that control role where you bring it against control. They can't counter it. You're putting big things into play. And you can even manipulate this a little bit Momir style. Like if you get to 10 mana. There's only three 10 drops currently legal in Historic. Impervious Great Worm, 1616 Indestructible, Jingataxias, and Ulamog. Like, having a 33% chance of Ulamog and knowing, worst case, you're getting a 1616 or a Jin, like, that's kind of insane, right? Like, you're just guaranteed yeah. to get one of those things. You don't even got to put them in your deck. So, I don't think it's a stapler or anything, but I, I do think this is a playable card. Like, I think there is a role for it. And... It does make me a little nervous, the level of variance. Like, most of the variance has been pretty controlled in this set, but this is the one card where I could see some frustration where it's going to be really swingy. Like, your opponent gets the perfect card that, you know, rasts your board or whatever, and you're just like, oh my god, I know it's like a 2% chance that that happens, and now I lose a game because of it or whatever. So, I could see that being a little bit of a frustration, but I think the card's neat. I love Momir, so it's, it's interesting to me, and I definitely plan on jamming it and just seeing what happens happens because it seems super fun yeah I, I feel that the cases where you outline where you actually play this like the mirror breakers the variance won't matter too much like you said if you're getting an eight drop probably any eight drop is sufficient uh but you know if you're trying to cast it for three or four something stabilizing against a board then the variance variance will hit you really hard but then you probably don't want to be playing this card in this case uh, but if you're going on turn 10 and trying to do a 10 drop, like any 10 drop will do. So the variance doesn't matter that much. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on from the world of Historic Horizons. We have a couple <laughs> a couple other interesting topics that I wanted to get to. I guess let, let's start with a couple a couple of questions that came up. One of them related to Historic Horizons. So these are questions that came up on Mark Rosewater's blogatog and uh, he put the question to the community, basically saying, what do y'all think about this? And Wizards does listen to these things, uh, so it is worth giving our feedback. So question number one is, essentially, do you want paper versions of all these arena-only cards? We were just talking about these Planeswalkers. There's some other ones that are legal and best of one standard. Do you want them to print paper versions of these cards, even though they are difficult and borderline impossible in some cases to actually use in paper. What do you guys think? What, how would you answer that question? I think more, it's more so how would they do that, right? I'm, I'm very curious in the how they would make that happen. And, and other than that, I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess we could try to see how these work in paper, but I'm curious how Conjure works. Good lord, I don't even know how that <laughs> Momir card would work. Um, so yeah, like, like oh, I ha have I, the judge I, throw a dart on a card or something <laughs> like that. And like, oh, that's the one you got. <laughs> so I, I would say I would have to imagine if they did put them in paper. 
I cannot imagine them being tournament legal. There's no way they're going to let, <laughs> they're going to want to deal with this in actual paper tournaments. So my guess would be, it'd be maybe silver border and you can like rule zero of them into your commander games or, or something like that. But I don't think they would let these cards be tournament legal if they did put them into paper. But R Richard, what do you think? Should they come to paper? I mean, perpetually can come, right? Per perpetually is one of those things that I really regret. Like there, there are some really clean answers to like, cards like you can perpetually give something minus two minus two so you don't have to worry about uh it recurring from the graveyard or something like that that can be done uh you could conjure things that conjure a fixed card like conjure a regal force can be done uh seek is impossible without the help of someone else to actually go through your library and same with like the momir card so i think some cards can come to paper but probably just don't do anything like I could see them making a perpetual card and adding it to a different set, right? And just having like the, the moto strategy of like just some cards get reprinted uh, into treasure chests or something, but other cards are left out. And perpetually can be one of those cards. Same with something that conjures a fixed card. Uh, and maybe they'll do it, but I'd rather them just not have this divide. Like Wizards has worked around this for so long and it's surprising they gave up like things like look at the top 10 cards of your library reveal two elves or something like that is just seek but you know limited uh, so it's weird that they went digital but if now that they've gone digital I don't think there's any point in trying to force it back into paper like you you have all the paper mechanics right so uh, I think they should just keep the lines clear and just say this is arena only versus you know, making people jump through hoops. Like, if we thought shuffling for fetches was bad, like, you want to call a judge over to seek an elf? Like, I don't know what you want to do here, right? Like, talk about slowing the game down to to nothing, right? So I'd rather just have it be digital. I've been, I've been on the fence about this one for since I've seen the question. So on one hand, I like the idea of people having the option to play with them if they want to, although... If you're going to be rule zeroing them into your commander game or something, you can do that with a proxy. So it's not like you can't play a card casually because it doesn't exist. So there's ways around that. I think my concern would be you can't let these be tournament legal because they just are going to take so long to resolve. It's just like imagine a Davriel. You negative to it. You have to choose randomly three of the offers from the eight, and then you got to randomly choose three of the off or conditions from the eight. Like even just doing that and potentially doing that every single turn is going to be so slow and clunky. So like technically you can do it. It's just not going to be fun. And I honestly would dread way more so than Walking Dead and all this other stuff people get up in arms about. But if someone came up to me and was like, hey, I want to play a game of Commander. It's full of these digitally exclusive cards. I would be kind of like, oh, like, okay, I guess, but I would be dreading it because it's just going to take forever to get through these cards in paper. The other thing that concerns me is now that we've broken this wall and we're doing digital stuff, I kind of hope Wizards goes further with it. If my biggest criticism with a lot of these cards is a lot of them are a little bit dull. Like, where's my Yag Saran or whatever? Like, if you're gonna do this, yeah. like, go all the way, go all the way. Like, Hearthstone it up, Wizards. Add Pioneer to Arena so people have a quote unquote real paper format to play if that's what they prefer. They, and they then prefer, just go. No, no, hold on. They prefer their RNG list format. <laughs> that hasn't happened before this. Yeah. And then just go wild, go wild, print, give, give us these crazy cards. And I think the crazier Wizards makes the cards, the harder, like, the harder it's going to be. You can't, there's no way you can Yogg Saron or whatever in, in paper. Like some of these other, like, really ridiculous cards. There's a, there's a new Hearthstone card. I would love to see it on Arena. It's, uh, enters the battlefield, shuffle a copy of your opponent's deck into your deck. Like, that's just such a cool, like, thief weird card. It's not good, but it's hilarious. And that's just stuff you could never do in paper. So I'm afraid if the idea is going to be we're going to also print these cards in paper, that'll kind of like handcuff wizards and not allow them to do all the cool things they could do digitally. I feel all right, betrayed, question. Seth. I feel betrayed. <laughs> <laughs> go play. Go play the H game if you want to play those effects. <laughs> what, what's what's going to separate magic from the H game? Well, I so so just to clarify this, I very strongly feel that. 
Wizards also needs to add a format like Pioneer. Like, I'm fine with Historic being Magic's Hearthstone, but I very strongly feel like if that's the direction, that there also needs to be a place where players can play their Magic cards outside of Standard that rotated, because not everyone wants to deal with these crazy digital cards. And I wouldn't want to deal with them all the time, honestly. I think it'd be cool to have a format where I could play a Hearthstone, like a Yogg-Saron or some ridiculous card, but I also want the option for when I want to play a horrible use of this term, but real magic, quote unquote, I could play a format that did not have like those cards in it. So, so that's my ideal solution is that they add Pioneer and then just go hog wild with, with Hearthstone cards and historic and Hearthstone's its own weird, unique digital only thing that isn't really connected to the rest of magic, but it's probably like pretty entertaining and fun to play. We're officially boomers um, now with the term real magic. Just like people say real magic before they printed planeswalkers. Real magic before they <laughs> messed everything up with mythics. You know, real magic before whatever, right? Like there's always been a quote unquote real magic. So I, I think we're officially boomers now. <laughs> now that we've actually just thought of that word and used it, right? Like uh, this is I know how it is, a, right? There's always a new magic. <laughs> It's a Fine. it's a horrible it's a horrible use of the term and I, I it's just the saying it any other way is so much clunkier but basically like magic that is playable in paper if that makes so, so, sense so literally like that, just tabletop magic <laughs> yeah I think that arena should have a non rotating format that mirrors tabletop for people who want that because that's been one of the big pieces of feedback that's come out about this set is. That matters to some people a lot, and they want to be able to like practice for their F and M or whatever. And I think that not well, having that, that in historic, well, no, that's why you'd have to have like Pioneer or something. But yeah, I don't know. So that's kind of how I I lean on it. So real magic is absolutely the wrong term, but trying to explain it all would take up half the podcast. So <laughs> sometimes you got to use the the bad term just to, for brevity's sake. Anyway, we got another uh, another question. Another mer- magic. Another magic question. This is uh, also from Mark Rose Walter's blog. So magic, obviously, doing some uh, crazy things recently, pushing boundaries, in the words of Mark Rosewater. Question is, since they're pushing boundaries, would you like to see a cyberpunk set or a space set? Now that we're pushing boundaries, what do you think? Should we push the boundaries in what planes we go to and so forth as well? I mean, if you're telling me I get to see, like, I don't know, Laurel in uh, 2049, I'm down for that. <laughs> so, uh, like... <laughs> I, I don't I don't know what set number what number you're gonna throw at the end of this set but throw, like take me there I'm I, I'm here for it right we if we're gonna have realms unbound or whatever right like if I'm gonna have to deal with Gandalf Frodo and the entire Shire I I I'm okay with the fact that you know we decide we want to go to yeah like as I said Lorwyn. 3049 or 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 whatever Kamigawa 2062 so. I, I, I'm okay with all of it. I'd love to see it like kind of like a cyberpunk S set because I've always liked the aesthetics of that. Oh, and the packs, the, think of the wrapping on the packs. They would be neon foil pink. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, yo, that, that, that would kind of be cool. I like, like that's, oh, oh, I actually, you know, as I think about it, I'm getting even more pumped about this. And I'm very sad that this doesn't exist yet. So yeah, <laughs> let's go there. Let's, cause we're doing that anyways. We're doing weird stuff. So. Let's go there. Isn't this Warhammer 40k? I'm gonna get roasted that's by space, everyone. That's space, right? I think I think that's space themed, right? I, I no, I thought that was like I like Warcraft. No, like no, with, I, with, 40k with, has like tanks and guns and stuff, right? War, technically, Warcraft also has tanks. <laughs> okay, hmm. okay, <laughs> hold your horses there, but I, I, hold my tanks. <laughs> I don't think it's such a stretch, you know, like fantasy games have gone cyberpunk before it's still fantasy i I don't know people are gonna eviscerate me for this but to me they're all similar and we have so many like what was kaladesh kaladesh doesn't feel traditional fantasy to me right so going cyberpunk doesn't seem that outlandish and like crim said if we're gonna go visit the shire and stuff what is what is visiting the future and stuff like that right so i'm all down for it and i'd rather see more of that than outside ips right so i'd rather wizards be exploring that kind of stuff than just adding spider-man into my game or something right 
But you could think about this. This is a two for one. You can put them together. Spider-Man or Lord of the Rings 2069. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Here we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I think that Cyberpunk's most likely happening based on the wizards registering the Kamigawa Neon Destiny like domain name and rumors about that being a future set. So I think that one's probably happening whether is whether we want it to or not. Or a pun. Uh, uh, unintentional, a few, <laughs> Uninten- being, a, unintentional being a future a few- set <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about space though like I'm fine with cyberpunk like I don't have really strict requirements I don't come from the fantasy background as much as some people so I don't have this thought of like oh this is or isn't fantasy this would or wouldn't work in a fantasy setting space though like I'm envisioning like NASA launching a rocket or something and me trying to envision uh, or like Star Wars. Oh, and, yeah. uh, Star Wars is space fantasy. Work? Yeah, that's okay. space fantasy. It would be yeah, Star Wars. Spaceships right? seem weird to me. A spaceship, you'd have like the Ewoks and stuff. Skyship but... Sovereign is fine. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's I guess pretty that's much pretty... it, right? The Skyship is literally just a Star Wars thing, right? I mean, it could work. <laughs> All right, all right. I think you can. Sure. All right, let's do space two. Vehicles, then. I think smugglers, I find it, I think is totally <laughs> fine. You know, it's totally on theme, on brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're doing so many, so many different things anyway, and especially with universes beyond. Like at this point, what what's the harm? <laughs> like, what's the harm if they do a cyberpunk set? Because there's so many different settings that are not traditional to magic uh, anyway coming into the game. So, yes, yeah, go for it. I guess. You know, with the idea of planes walking in a multiverse, it's very like, you know, comic books do it all the time, right? There's a noir verse out there for like Marvel, right? So, so there's all these different worlds and timelines in a multiverse that it's like, it's not unreasonable for me to imagine that. Yeah, of course there is a cyberpunk esque timeline and it's not hard for me to imagine Jason space, right? Like, <laughs> let, let's <laughs> 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 like whatever you know it'll be funny like i'll chuckle as i cast you know it, there, there's shirtless jace but now there's space jace and like, <laughs> like why not right <laughs> oh yeah i mean i guess i guess it'll be pretty inter- interesting to see at least so oh all right one one other topic before fish mail and this one cracked me up so <laughs> There was a Reddit post this week from someone who uh, wanted to do a little research on ranking up on Magic Arena. So what they did is they built a mono-red Cavalcade of Calamity deck, which is not a top-tier deck by any means. They just kind of threw together, you know, cheap red cards in their collection. And they played games only casting the cards of their hand from left to right. So they were trying to simulate playing really poorly and not having any control over the order of the uh, of which you play your cards. That is a pretty big restriction. And it took them 652 games, but they went from uh, the bottom of silver, I think, is where they were start counted, all the way up to Mythic. They hit Mythic, playing their cards uh, essentially at random. What do you think about this? We, we've had this big debate going on since Arena came around about how much being mythic matters. It's something that is that like a proxy for someone's play skill or an ability. I've always kind of been like, eh, I don't know. Like, it seems like if you just play enough games, you can get there. Does this prove that Arena ranking like doesn't actually mean anything? If this person can hit mythic <laughs> playing in the worst possible way you know you possibly could without a real tier deck even like what do you think of this research project if you were telling me this were a control deck or a, like you know a deck like a mid-range deck then then i would say well actually yeah that, that'd be surprising i don't think you could do it but because it's a mono red deck i do think like you can do that right because a lot of it eventually because you're if you're taking the legal actions that you can uh, then you're you're gonna be fine, right? Because you're still playing one drops that are still aggressive, and some people will just not have the answer for that. So, like, yeah, like I I I don't think that this diminishes any of like what a mythic what mythic means. <laughs> to me, this is more so just hilarious and a cool thing to see on its own. <laughs> I mean, it like it's already happened before. You've played against Tron, right? 
<laughs> yeah. I, I have. So are you saying that mono red takes no skill crim? Is that, is that oh, what you're no, saying? No. <laughs> I'm saying that there's enough low curve things on there that eventually you could get there, right? Like there's enough, like, like just going left from right. If I took every legal action that I could, it's it's just like, boom, all right, one drop. That's a legal action. This one drop's probably going to hit you, right? <laughs> and this one drop, if you have a cavalcade, will definitely hurt you. So over time, you, there will be, just be enough one drops for you to just, like, get there. I feel yeah, you could probably do the same with mid-range. Um, could you? I think so, actually. Uh, maybe we could ask whoever did this to see if they want to suffer another 700 yeah. games of mid-range. But part of it <laughs> well, okay. is speed. Like, yeah. the mono red deck is fast, and part of it is just right. getting, like, most people who get Mythic know that it's about getting the number of games in, right? Like, it's, it's like, do you actually care enough to play the prerequisite number of games? And then the faster your deck is, the easier it is to hit those number of games. So, it's not too surprising, but at the same time, it is a little surprising that you don't really need to do anything. It means it's very easy to bot your way to Mythic. Like, no knowledge is needed, right? So if you are a bot creator, you just make a mono red cavalcade deck and play your cards from left to right, and you'll eventually hit Mythic. Um, but that doesn't mean that mono red doesn't take skill, because then if it, if you, it does you could, take you could, skill, yeah, you could maybe hit you'll faster just, if you yeah played well as opposed to right? instead of six hundred. Yeah, you get there like one hundred and fifty. Yeah, or something. But, right. <clears throat> The other interesting part is how the actual process went, and I hadn't really thought much about the matchmaking, but if you actually read the the Reddit post, they got stalled out at Platinum and were losing and losing, and they were they thought they were stuck and not going to be able to get there, but then after losing enough games, they must have had their MMR or whatever drop enough, and they said they started playing against like starter decks and saw no, like a noticeable qu- uh, drop in quality of their opponents and their opponents' decks, and then all of a sudden, that was enough to let them start winning again, and they progressed to Diamond and eventually to Mythic, so I hadn't really, really realized. In response to this, someone said, wow, I'm going to try to just go on to arena and like drop a hundred times before I try to rank up to try to get myself down to a lower like MMR or whatever it is. And then I should be able to rank up really easily. Do you think that's actually like a legit technique? Would that work? Should you go on and like scoop a bunch of times to drop your ranking and then you'll have an easier pathway to getting to mythic. I mean, people do this all the time in like ga- other games. Yeah. Right. They, they pr- intentionally tank their MMR just so that they get paired against, you know, like just have a, a smooth sailing uh, to whatever rank they want to get. You see it all the time in like first, like like Valorant, you see it all the time, you know, in like other, just all sorts of games that use an MMR system. So not surprising. And now, I guess, you know, the joke before was that, hey, I have a Smurf account on on, on Arena. <laughs> like might be real now. It's not a joke anymore. You could have a Smurf account. <laughs> Like, same with other games. Like, what is the point, right? The, you, you spend all this time tanking your MMR to then play non-games against people that you're way better than. So you just stomp all the way through and then you end up at Mythic, but you probably could have just got to Mythic playing the normal way. Uh, so I don't understand what the real point is. I mean, I guess if you want to make a video saying, look at my jank deck go 10 I guess you could do something like that, right? But other than that, defeats the purpose of the game right you just lose a lot to then stomp someone who you shouldn't be playing and then that's it like i, I don't know when, it seems counterproductive <laughs> but sure you could when when i add all this up together i'm pretty convinced that well, being mythic maybe doesn't mean a whole lot like if you can bot your way to mythic or you can lose 100 times in a row and then crush intro decks to mythic maybe you just like mythic doesn't actually mean a whole lot and it's kind of just for fun i don't know like if there's one thing that i've taken away from all this it's like it makes me skeptical when i see oh i'm mythic you know whatever i'm kind of like okay like did you bought it (laughs) like how, how did how did you get to mythic like we don't really know so it has made me less impressed with arena rank and maybe make me feel better about not hitting mythic sometimes because i mean i i could have gotten there i just didn't you know build a bot so <laughs> it's not me <laughs> i just didn't put in all the i, I think i need to build us a bot so we can always have mythic so we always have the clout 
Uh, but you know, when I, when I play, I'm like bronze three or whatever the heck, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, sure, I'll go play some bronze games, right? Because I cannot play, you know, the number of hours every season just to get to Mythic for internet bragging points, right? So I don't think the latter, like, I think once you hit Mythic once or twice, right? Unless you're super dedicated, unless you're streaming or something, like, it's just a lot of games to play, which you may not want to, right? And if you want to do it efficiently, you got to play the fastest tier deck, to do it and you know you're punished for experimenting you're punished for playing control decks the fact that Krim can hit mythic is a miracle in itself given how long his games take <laughs> uh, like you're just punished on so many different dimensions for not playing like fast aggro right like that's just the best way to do it such that like there's no point right like just play what you want for fun do whatever you want maybe end up gold platinum whatever right it's gonna reset in a month anyway so it's fine Ah, well, good, good parting words. And I think on that note, it might be time for some fish mail. So Richard, take it away. All right. Uh, from, oh, if you have questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail. And we'll get to your question on air. Uh, first question from, oh no, I lost it already. Where was it? Uh, from Suga Time. Uh, so we didn't talk about this, but they are permanently adding 100 card historic brawl to arena. Uh, what are the odds that WotC starts selling EDH pre-cons on Arena? What are the odds of multiplayer? I'd switch to Arena as the main way I play MTG if these two things happened. Uh, multiplayer's not happening. Now, Wizards has been pretty pretty upfront about that they don't think that multiplayer can come to Arena. So that's one that I would not be expecting. Uh, pre-cons? Maybe? Although... Wizards makes a lot of money doing it currently, and they haven't shown a whole lot of signs that they are willing to make the arena economy way more mm, consumer friendly. So I would be surprised if you could get something equivalent to like a commander precon at a reasonable price. Uh, maybe they do like they've done a couple on Magic Online in the past, but I don't think there's any way they would release like every commander deck or brawl deck onto the client. It would probably be, you know, a one time thing, one deck a year or something like that, just to give new players an intro into the format. But uh, I think both are relatively unlikely. I just don't. Yeah, like there, there's no way. There's just no. I, I, I don't see how. We, we, before we even try to see if we get uh, a multiplayer format, let, let's make sure that you know. It, like, I, I want to see that they could even handle adding more old cards. Yeah, I, I'd rather them not do it. Like, s s same with the uh, Moto Commander One v One issue where. They put it on, people try it, they're like, oh, 1v1 sucks, and then they think Commander sucks and you never play again, right? Like, 1v1 is like a totally different beast than than a four-player multiplayer game, so I'd rather them not pretend it's there, like, call it, you know, 100-card Historic Brawl, right? It is not Commander, it is not 1v1 Commander, it's not any of those things, right? And I think, you know, keep the line separate, because you don't want people to play 1v1 get destroyed by brawl or whatever and then think this is all commander is about and never play commander in paper uh so i'd rather them keep it separate because multiplayer is totally different than 1v1 uh next question mostly mtg how much harder slash more expensive will historic horizons be due to its distribution model you can't buy packs you won't get wildcard uh progress and you're forced to grind it out whether you want to or not <clears throat> uh a lot like i i've been dreading this the original jumpstart was insanely expensive and we were looking at it on stream the other day there's actually not that many cards that are especially higher rarity cards that you really need there's like muxus and allosaurus shepherd but really the original jumpstart didn't have a lot of cards that see heavy play this set has a ton of modern staples that seem playable it's got even more cards and it has, you know, the player unfriendly distribution model. I would not be surprised that, I don't know, it costs a thousand dollars for me to get all the cards I need from the single set or something. Like, I think it's going to be 
insanely, absurdly, over the top, like ridiculously expensive. And I'm in a unique position where I need all the cards, even the bad ones, because some of the ones that aren't good are going to be funny and, you know, make a good video. So you won't necessarily need that. But it's still, even for the average player, it is just not a easy cheap way to get cards like if you enjoy playing the format that's great you get to do the drafts and if you do enough of them you'll open some cards eventually but boy the economy of jumpstart is real real rough yeah my, my wild card collection is sweating unless these are for some <laughs> odd reason everything here is common and uncommon i am sweating because i i only have like a hundred i have under 200 rare wild cards and i have like 30 mythic rares so there's You're already rich. I got like two mythics is always my pinch. I got plenty of commons, but I'm always scraping by for mythics. Oh, I wish I had 30. I mean, Mr. That Mr. Used... Money Bags over there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like the thing is, though, like this mostly I, I think I need everything just like you do. Right. So, yeah. and, you know, and I got to get started on that uh, Teo and Kiora deck. So I've got to throw <laughs> some wild cards into the wind. And I'm not excited to throw eight away for those two. So, uh, like, but, but legitimately, this is, uh, this consumer model is, is, uh, well, it's not even hiding anything anymore. Right? It's just like, yeah, we, we want to make that. They used to have, the, like, originally, Historic was supposed to be two wild cards per card. Right. Everyone was very upset with how much that would cost us uh, to play historic then. Well, now this is just like this is just worse. Right. Well, they're just going to get their money somehow. That's kind of how it feels like they're like, oh, well, if we can't charge two wild cards per card, we will find a way to make that same amount of dollars, <laughs> you know, in another way that everyone won't complain about because it's not as obvious. <laughs> I mean, when we talked about adding modern to arena, right, people are like, well, if you add all the cards to modern, how are people going to collect them all? You need to come up with a new model. And the answer is, nah, we'll just do it the same way, right? <laughs> like You just have to own literally every card, uh, you know, which is feasible almost if you play standard and you draft a lot. You could actually like attain most of a set. But with the rate of which they're adding cards to historic, like imagine to play modern, you needed to own all modern cards, right? If you wanted uh to to have more than one deck like that's kind of where they're going with this and it's very difficult there's like a huge pinch on wild cards and i bet you the answer is wizards will sell wild cards in the car in the store and that'll be their answer to to how to deal with this uh but i mean we can only hope that by the way like that that to me is something i don't even know if they'll do but if they do that'd be amazing I just need the depending on the price. Less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's my $10 only concern. Ten dollars a mythic. Oh my god! I, yeah, I I think that would be cheap. <laughs> oh, you, wait, gonna... really? You they'd be on the cheap end? Good lord! Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I I don't know. From everything I've seen, like and be more than that to get the mythic that you need right now with the current system. So that's always my fear because it sounds like such a good solution. But then whenever I ask people about it and how much they'd be willing to pay, it's usually like, oh, like, I don't know, five rares for a dollar, you know, a <laughs> mythic for a dollar. I'm like, oh, my God, we're very far apart. What we as the community want and what Wizards wants to sell these cards for. There is a huge gulf in there. So. It would make it easier to get the single cards. That's my biggest problem with the economy is I, I'm always pinched on mythics and then I'll have a card, uh, I'll have a deck where I need like a playset of a mythic or like a couple copies of a mythic that I don't have a playset of. And the way to get that mythic is just like spam open a bunch of packs until you get wild cards, which it just, I love opening packs and arena like greatly diminishes my love of opening packs. It's just like opening packs on arena hurts rather than being fun and enjoyable for me. So. Uh, hopefully they do something, but I, I don't have much faith. They make so much money right now. What is their incentive to improve it? Like, I think they view us as a community that's going to complain about it, but then uh, Jumpstart's going to release, and I'm going to give them that $1,000 or whatever it takes to get the cards I need, and they're going to just, you know, keep doing what they do. Well, we need our Conjure wild cards. Where <laughs> the wild <laughs> card is good for like four bulk mythics, right? Like that's the biggest problem, right? If you want your Teos, they cost as much as Freilises. So are you really going to make any Teos? Right? Are you going to make some Freilises? And I think that's the crux of the problem, right? And I think for the long-term health of the game, it's a problem. Like you don't see any innovation. There's no such thing as a budget deck, really. 
Uh, and everyone just has to play tier cards because if you're gonna use your precious wild cards, why not use them on known good cards rather than experimenting with like off the wall decks, right? And it's just not worth it. So everyone just plays the tier cards, everyone complains how the metagame is stale, and then here you are, right? So Wizards yeah. needs to find some way to make the quote unquote bad cards cheaper so people actually have some diversity and have a reason to build those bad cards other than, you know, trying to do it for the memes or whatever, right? I just I wish they had a, a program like we have on Magic Online. If there was a, a loan program or a subscription, that would be the most probably player friendly solution. Although I still imagine it's either gonna cost way more than most people would like to see, like on a monthly basis, or uh, or wizards just wouldn't do it because they would feel like they weren't making enough money. But I think that's would be the best solution. I I totally agree that part of the reason the meta seems so stale is people just can't afford to build the decks you want. You see lots of comments and tweets and posts about that. Like, I would like to play this janky fun against odds deck, but I just cannot justify spending my wild cards on the janky fun card. So I have to buy, you know, rogues or mono rat or whatever is actually competitive. Uh, and that's, uh, it just makes it so much less fun. I wish, I wish players could play the fun things they enjoy, but the arena economy is just not set up to allow that for the average player. All right, that's all the time we have for fish mail this week. Uh, thank you to everyone who sent them in. If you have questions, send them to at mggoldfish with the hashtag mggfishmail, and we'll get to your questions on air. And I believe that that brings us to the end of episode 340 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So, Richard, Krim, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we will be back next week to talk about whatever goes on in the world of magic. So, until then, have an amazing week, everyone. And this is the crew signing out. Bye.